Uh, well, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. I'm going to talk about the neurobiological foundation of attachment, of bonding, of love, if you will. I will then use the finding to describe a novel model on resilience and then tell you preliminary results from a synchrony enhancing intervention for, for postpartum depression. So we have the entire arc from theory to science to intervention. And I'd like to begin with some images. These are images of the mother-infant bond. The mother-infant bond is the key icon of Western civilization, a symbol of eternal joy, bliss, unending devotion. But along that main story, there have always been a backstory of said Madonna and adult-looking child. According to some art historian, before the 17th century, this adult-looking child was represented as an ugly infant. So look at these mothers. They are detached, they are forlorn, they are sad, they are not looking at their infant. By any coding system, they would be defined as depressed. And this sadness that parallel the story of eternal bliss is due to the attachment paradox. For all mammals, creatures who mature in the mother's body and develop with immature brains, systems that sustain endurance, plasticity, stress management, and social fitness, what we generally put under the umbrella of resilience, mature in the young in the context of the mother's body and its distinct provision. But the story for humans is especially difficult because mothers have to lend themselves for a very lengthy period of protracted maturation. Humans complete their brain maturation by the time they are nearly 30. But also because proximity to the mother's body is insufficient for humans. And mothers have to engage in a very, very complex and finely tuned process of biobehavioral synchrony that is required for the maturation of the human infant's social, symbolic, and affective competencies. So what is biobehavioral synchrony? It is defined as the coordination of biology and behavior between mother and infant during moments of social contact. At the third month of life, when infants begin to engage in the social world, mother and infant begin to coordinate their nonverbal behavior in the gaze, in the affect, in the vocal motherese, in the affectionate touch behavior. In a series of studies, we found that those moments when mother and infant coordinate their nonverbal behavior provide a template for the coordination of their um, physiological processes. So only during moments of behavioral synchrony, but not during moments of non-synchrony, mother and infant also coordinate their heart rhythms after a synchronous, but not after a non-synchronous interaction. Parent and infant release oxytocin in a coordinate way. And as I will show you later, only during a face-to-face -face synchronous interaction, but not in a back-to-back -back or no-gaze interaction, mother and infant also coordinate their brain response, synchronize their brain response in keynotes of the social brain. The experience of biobehavioral synchrony is a critical environmental input infants must experience in the sensitive period between zero and nine months prior to the onset of language and the first reorganization of the prefrontal cortex. And that key experience carries implication both lengthwise and widthwise. In several longitudinal samples spanning birth or infancy to adulthood, we found that synchrony keeps playing in the dyadic relationship. It is individually stable. It's like the 12-bar blues that keeps on playing in the left hand, while new abilities kick in and are integrated into the mother-child dialogue. Symbolic play in the toddler year, uh, extensive imagination in preschool, the ability for empathy in later childhood, uh, the ability to um, dialogue multiple perspective, until in health, mother and child can meet each other in an adult-to-adult -adult relationship of autonomy, of engagement, of mutuality, while still retaining the old rhythm and the mother-child position. But not only 
across time in the mother-child relationship, but also across relationship. So we have behavioral synchrony, the matching of nonverbal cues. We have autonomic synchrony of heart rhythms. We have hormonal synchrony. We have brain-to-brain -brain synchrony. And studies have found that these are found in various formats and constellation across all human social bond between parents and children, both mothers and fathers, between romantic partners, both during the period we fall in love and in long-term romantic relationship, between close friend. This is new between therapist and patients, and now we have mapped all four types of synchrony between pa patients and therapists that are related to the treatment allies and therapy outcome, and also in fellow humans, a stranger we meet on the train or in the bus stop, and we begin to engage with them, and synchrony begins to emerge. Well, we have to remember that synchrony is by no means a full and total match. There is no live human process, no live natural process that implies perfect synchrony. It's a process of mismatch and repair, coordination and miscoordination, and then the going in and out of synchrony, as we will see with the depressed moms, is just as important to the process of synchrony as the match itself. So even in the time of key synchrony, nonverbal synchrony at around three to nine months, synchrony, the match should not be more than approximately 33%. So the, the coordination between match and mismatch in the study of synchrony occurs at several levels. First, the relational topic, the secure base of the first week, the nonverbal coordination in the first months, the symbolic expansion of the toddler, the empathic dialogue of the child, and the mutuality, reciprocity, autonomy, and self-disclosure of the adult, and all are integrated like harmonics into the relationship with some match and mismatch in each topic. There is the level of synchrony at the level of the micro level of the interaction. Some seconds were tuned in, some seconds were tuned out. We repair, we go in, we go out of synchrony. There's the day-by-day -day synchrony, any long term relationship has days when we are more attuned, more synchronized days that we are less attuned and we can repair. And also in a relation to the developmental topics, some mothers are better synchronized with a dependent infant, whereas others cannot stand very much the dependence and are better off with a struggling adolescent. Across all levels, synchrony stands at the flexible midpoint between the pole of depression, disengagement, withdrawal, and the pole of overlap, intrusive, and hypersociality between depression and anxiety, where the key feature of biobehavioral synchrony is its, fle its flexibility and plasticity. Now, these are the three foundations of the biology of attachment. Biobehavioral synchrony, the coordination of biology and behavior during social moment, which I just described. The second one is the oxytocin system in its role as an integrative interface that connects the stress, the reward, and the immune system, and the affiliative brain, the brain network of attachment that comp comprises the subcortical network of mammalian parenting with a higher order cortical network of empathy, embodiment, mentalization, and emotion regulation. So let me just say very, very briefly about the other two foundations of the biology of love, oxytocin and the affiliative brain. Oxytocin is a very ancient system. It's presumably evolved via gene duplication in jaw fish approximately 500 million years ago, and its role across animal evolution from nematodes to human was to help organisms manage life in harsh ecology, stress management, water conservation, thermoregulation, etc. With the evolution of mammals, oxytocin became causally involved in the mammalian condition, controlling uterine contraction and milk lectin, what makes us mammals. But the shift that happened with the mammalian condition through oxytocin is that mammals learn to manage stress through relationship. So any 
system that has been managed through oxytocin before the evolution in mammal is now given to be regulated through relationship. Now, in this one slide, I summarized for you approximately 20 years of oxytocin research in my lab, approximately, I would say, 85 papers. So this is a real snippet of our oxytocin research. The first surprising finding were studies about fathers, that fathers have similar levels of oxytocin than mothers, even right after birth even when mothers are nursing, which means that fathers are in some way biologically prepared to take care of children, but they do it through a different pathway. The second is that... Um, we need technical assistance with the technical, pointer. Technical, it's not. Second, I'll tell you, is that um, oxytocin is released following touch, contact, and affectionate physical caress with those we love. It has to be, when you heard the term oxytocin hug, is that, you know, an oxytocin hug that, that lasts approximately 30 seconds. It's not just an occasional hug, but those are able to release oxytocin. So if you want to send your loved one to their day's work and make them healthy and less stress, give them a big hug, a long hug, uh, before they go. Here it is. The third is about oxytocin and falling in love. We now have data on baseline oxytocin from infancy, first weeks of life until old age. The highest, the period where you have the highest baseline oxytocin is at the first three months of falling in love to cement the relationship, which is not naturally cemented. So this is evolutionary trick on us. You think you're walking on cloud nine, you're actually walking on very, very high levels of oxytocin. And the last issue is what happens to the oxytocin system when bonding is disrupted, conditions such as premature birth, chronic trauma, poverty, and what we will see soon today, postpartum depression. So in these conditions, when the bonding is disrupted, the oxytocin functionality of both mother and child are disrupted in um, condition-specific ways. Now, as to the affiliative brain, which is, as I said, built on the brain basis of mammalian caregiving. So researchers already in the 1950s dis discovered the role of the medial preoptic area in the hypothalamus in the initiation of mammalian maternal care, uh, primed by the hormones of pregnancy, oxytocin, prolactin, the MPOA, the hypothalamus, which is also where oxytocin is produced, sends two tracks. I call them the scare to the amygdala and the bliss to the dopamine reward, the subcortical, the VTA, the dopamine reward factory. And they sensitize a subcortical system that underpins mammalian um, maternal care that enable a mammalian mothers from red to elephant to recognize and invest and nurse and provide a secure habitat for their infants. Now in humans, this subcortical system is found in all human fMRI studies of the parental brain, but it's insufficient to prepare human children for the and for the task of joining the human social world. So we have this mammalian maternal care, the amygdala, the reward factory, and the hypothalamus, but those are connected via multiple ascending and descending projection to three major cortical systems, the empathy network, the mentalizing network, the temporal or temporal parietal network, and the frontal, later evolving, a frontal system. And all these together, the subcortical and cortical, the bottom up and top down, cohere into the human caregiving network. And what you see here in the red, you see the subcortical network where there is what I call the marriage of oxytocin and dopamine deep in the nucleus accumbens. There are a neuron that express for both heteromeres that express for both oxytocin and dopamine, and they are uh, involved in the creating the engram, the stamp of the loved one in our brain, but those are embedded in the brain and are surrounded by the large cortical area of the network. And because of the parsimony, parsimony principle of evolution, this is the attachment network that supports all 
attachment bonds throughout life, parental, romantic, friendship, and they're not yet uh, patient therapists, but I bet this is what that will be found in meaningful long-term patient therapist relationship. Now, how is synchrony implemented or implicated in the human parental brain? Let me give you two studies, one which compares synchronous to anxious mom and one which tells us the story of simulated depression. This is one of the first studies on the parental brain uh, we conducted. Uh, we always go to the natural ecology, just like the ethologist and Lawrence, you want to study bonding, you have to put on your boots and go to the ecology. We go to the home, we videotape mother and infant in their home, we bring it to the lab, we code for synchrony, and here we divided two different mothers. Mothers who were synchronous, uh, responded to their infant cue, went along their infant rhythms, and mothers who were intrusive, who disregarded the infant cues, were overmatching and provided a lot of stimulatory contact. And we had mothers watch their own interaction, their other infant interaction. The comparison is us usually used to measure attachment. And throughout about 45 minutes, and we watched, the first thing we asked is, what areas um, show difference between the synchronous and the intrusive moms, and we found that the amygdala is much more activated in the intrusive moms, whereas the nucleus accumbens, the reward network, is much more activated in the synchronous moms. And then we use the amygdala and the nucleus accumbens as seed region throughout this 45 minutes and asked what connects synchronizes in the brain along with the amygdala seed region or the nucleus accumbens. And what we found is that synchrony, which is underpinned by the nucleus accumbens, by a sense of reward, brings with it the entire brain. So it connects online with the empathy, the mentalization, and the emotion regulation network. But the amygdala, those anxious moms which hyperactivate their amygdala, they don't have any top-down. So it becomes about themselves and not with empathy and mentalizing about the infant. And again, these areas were uh, linked with the mother's oxytocin levels. So here you see how all these things are connected, where synchrony is related to an underlying reward coloring, which brings together, integrates all the brain system that allows the mother to be about the baby. This is another study, a more recent study, where again we went to the homes. It's a uh, oxytocin administration study, so moms came twice a week apart, oxytocin or placebo, and they saw three episodes unavailable where mothers were using their phones. A lot of mothers using the phone in the presence of their infant, thinking they are spending time with their infants. The other one is the simulated depression, the still face paradigm. And the third one is the social, the peekaboo game, which is really the typical, universal, in every culture you find mothers engaging in a peekaboo game. And they saw themselves versus unfamiliar matched moms. So the first thing you see is needs no word. When mothers see herself interacting in a synchronous social setting with her baby, the brain is on fire, the entire network is activated. But you see when depression in terms of still face and unavailable, it's just as bad as depression, the brain is gray, so this colorful brain Brain on fire versus gray brain differentiate the synchronous from the depressed model. And what we looked at is also the, the engram, the, the 12 bar blues, the music, the rhythm. We looked at the rhythm of the mother-own relationship in her own brain. Are there rhythms that we measured minute by second by second that come again in the two um, in the two imaging session. And what we saw that only in the social interaction were there uh, repeated rhythms between the two observations, as if the mother's brain is imprinted with these rhythms and keeps it. And the areas that carry that special rhythm is the insula, the amygdala, and the temporal pole, which are considered to be part of the socio-temporal brain. 
Now the next question is, are these all nice colors or do they transfer to the child? When we think about the cross-generation transmission of attachment or the neurobiology of attachment, do we see the same network activated in the child, not only in the parent? This is a 20-year study where we saw, you see Raphael and Enat, you see them at three months, then you see them again at nine to 12 years, here this kid is about 10, and then we saw them at 20 to 24 years as young adults. So we have videotape from the home at three months, at 10 years, and at 24 years, and then they do the same paradigm, they come to the magnet and they watch their entire relational history themselves ver versus a matched, unfamiliar boy or girl. We try to even match the hair color, a child and an adult, and to see whether the same network will be activated and what happened to the representation over time. And we saw two very interesting things. First, we saw that it's exactly the same network that activates in the mother when she sees her baby, that activates in the child when he sees his or her entire relationship with the mother. And the second thing is really very interesting, particularly interesting for us as clinician, is that we see no difference. Even in the amygdala that you see some differences, these are not significant, that the level of activation to seeing yourself as an infant and to seeing yourself as an adult, where everything is different, you look, you, the temporal distance, your mentalization, your verbal ability, everything is very different, as if the brain creates a certain module, what Bowlby called internal working model, which is called mommy and me, or attachment, and it is cemented. This is probably the module the child will use in his future parenting of his or her own children. This is the module we need to, to look at or connect to as clinician when relationships have not been so favorable and we want to change them. Now, when we looked at how synchrony is implicated in the single brain, I want us to take a quick look at how synchrony is Im implicated in the two brain, two brain between parents and children. Now, this is a video from the New York Times, approximately, I think, about two years ago. A researcher implemented electrodes into the prefrontal cortex of two mice, and they were strangers, so normally they would go into two sides of the chamber. And when they activated the, the electrodes synchronously, look at these mice. They became best friends, they huddled, they socially interacted. And when those same mice, the electrodes, were activated asynchronously, Synchrony, they lost interest. And this was um, a causal demonstration for the power of interbrain synchrony and sociality. Same is with human. We cannot do causal work like that. We borrow from animal models, and this is called hyperscanning, the simultaneous collection of neural data from two or more individuals. This is how it looks in my lab. And there are several key assumptions to hyperscanning research. The first is that the brain is a situated organ which evolved to respond online to social signals. So if we want to understand or study the social brain, we can't just do it when we're lying in a magnet, but we have to do it during live social interaction, and this is why hyperscanning research is so important maybe just as a, as a supplement, but as a tool to understand what's going on in real time when two people are interacting. It's a bottom-up approach. Neural synchrony is grounded in behavioral coordination. And since turning the brain to the social work world occurs within the mother-infant bond, we believe that studying interbrain communication or brain-to-brain -brain synchrony within parents and children is a very good entry point to understanding how the social brain functions. So here is our study on maternal chem chemo signals and hence um, infant-adult brain-to-brain synchrony. We, we know. need some technical support to fix Opa. that. Okay, we know that infants are attracted to order associated with their mothers, that newborn can detect matern maternal chemo signal from their amnio, that mother-body order uh, is... Uh, um, elicits infant attention, it's soothing to the infant, and we 
um, expected that maternal chemo signal will enhance infant adult brain to brain synchrony. So here is the study. A few days before visiting the labs, we took a clean t shirt, we gave it to the moms, moms who live around the neighborhood, around the university. They wore the night the t shirt for two consecutive nights and they put it in a glass jar between and they brought it with them, the infants were between five and 10 months, th those times of the critical period before the initiation of language. And then they came with their infant to the lab and there were three paradigms. First, we saw mothers in a back-to-back -back versus the same proximity in a face-to-face -face interaction, we're both having an EEG cap. And then we had an infant interacting with a stranger. The stranger was a mother from the same neighborhood who had a baby the same age as our baby. And it was randomized once when you have the RN, you see the RN t-shirt, the t-shirt infused with a mother's body odor, and the other one was a, just looked exactly the same, a clean t-shirt. So they were mother back to back, mother face to face, with a stranger with and without the mother's chemo signal. And this is what we found. First thing we found is that face to face interaction and indeed enhance brain to brain synchrony a lot more than back to back interaction. So we need gay synchrony to say to each other, we are on and then our brain begin to communicate. Second is the exclusivity of human attachment. Infant interact, the brain to brain synchrony between infants and their own mother is a lot higher, significantly higher than the synchrony with the strange mothers. But the third and interesting finding that was even more so than what we looked for is that maternal chemo signal, maternal ba body odor completely abolished this difference, completely attenuated the difference so that with the pre in the presence of maternal body odor, infants synchronized with a stranger. Now think about our collective history when mothers raise children through all the mothers all together. And infants need the, to see their mothers, to hear their mother, but smell is the only sensory cue that mothers could leave and tell the child, well, these women in the tent, you could trust them. And then she can go and come back and the infant knows how to synchronize with those women where it is safe to synchronize with. And this is a mechanism we believe by which mothers transfer the infant from the intimacy of the mother-infant bond to life within social group. And the connection, and I want you to remember the connection because we will look at it in postpartum depression. The connection upon which all these exclusivity and social connections and face-to-face -face road on this was one connection between the mother's fright, um, central right and the infant temporal right. It's a right to right brain. The right brain uh, communicates social and effective nonverbal cue. The right hemisphere matures quicker in the first three years before the onset of language. Theta rhythms are the rhythms of the developing brain, and it's the temporal, it's those stimulation during face-to-face -face synchronous exchange that mothers uh, develop the infant uh, social brain, the temporal region, which during that period between three and ten months undergoes rapid maturation. So infants need that input to their right um, temporal region in order to develop the social brain. And now that we've seen processes of synchrony in the single brain and synchrony in the two brain, let's move to resilience and to the story of maternal depression. So in recent years, there is a shift from a focus on psychopathology to a focus on adaptation, from a focus on diagnosis to a focus on functioning, and there is a need for biological and behavioral markers of resilience that will be theori theoretically based, scientifically proven, and as much as possible would give a signature of specific condition. Here is our model on 
um, resilience which is based on the story of mammals and the notion that humans develop systems that sustain resilience in the context of the early maternal infant or parent infant bonding. It has three tenets of resilience. Plasticity, which applies to all living matter. Think about COVID-19, a very plastic organism. Uh, sociality across mammalian species, sociality that is related to bonding, related sociality of um, animals, young who are born from the mother's body with immature brain, and human-specific aspect of resilient, feature of resilient is meaning, is the ability to connect the distant past and the projected future through um, cultural, religious, narrative, or meaning system, and through acts of kindness that transcend the life of the individual. And the three foundations that I told you about, biobehavioral synchrony, oxytocin, and the affiliative brain, are all implicate plasticity, take part in sociality, and imbue us with a sense of meaning. So with this, let me move to the story of maternal depression and how do relationship become brain, the long-term effects of parenting on child's affiliative brain. This is a study we started in 2000. The children are now, we're seeing now the children when they're about 21, 22, and we image their brain. And I just want to give you snippets from the follow-up that uh, relate to biobehavioral synchrony, to the oxytocin system, and to the brain basis of attachment. So at nine months, we measured Synchrony, at six years, we measured oxytocin. 12 to 13 years, through MEG imaging, uh, the brain basis of attachment. What we see here are very um, uh, severe difficulties of depressed mother to move in and out of synchrony. So synchrony begins with gaze coordination. I look at you, you look at me, and we tell each other, we're on this interaction. It takes depressed mothers five times longer to reach the first episode of gaze-to-gaze -gaze, gaze synchrony with their infant. But then mothers are the first to break their gaze and gaze avert. After mother break the gaze, infant avert their gaze, they stop vocalizing, and they reduce their positive affect, and the dyad stay in this inability to repair seven times longer than a typical dyad. So the whole cycle of in and out of synchrony is disrupted. You could see it in this uh, conditional um, like sequential analysis. Depressed mothers tend to be the one that break the gaze with the infant within two seconds, and they need to, and the infant would stop vocalizing after, infant would gaze avert and stop vocalizing within two seconds of their mother's uh, breaking their gaze. Now, what happened in six years? Children who were exposed to chronic maternal depression, 60% of them would have an Axis I diagnosis by the time they reach first grade, which is a lot. It's four times more than 15% in the natural population. You see the, the distribution of... Uh, the distribution of disorders, not yet depression, but it's anxiety and conduct mainly. What you see in terms of oxytocin is that there were low level of oxytocin in both mothers and fathers who are not depressed, but could be through biobehavioral synchrony or through assortative mating. They also have lower level of oxytocin and in the children. So the children are growing up in what we call um, impoverished, oxytocin impoverished, a low level of oxytocin environment, no hugging, no synchrony, no overt uh, affiliative signs. And what happened at 12 years? They watched again in the MEG. They watched themselves interacting at six years. We didn't use the infancy, so we wanted them to, to see themselves as they are or close to as they are now, as opposed to uh, a matched interaction. And what you see both in the beta band and in the gamma band, this bright stretch of the insula and STS, is not only lower level of activation, but you see that the brain does not distinguish between own attachment stimuli and unfamiliar. So this really tells us that the children of depressed moms, when mother is chronically depressed throughout the first years 
of life, it doesn't prepare the child brain to meet other, to meet the next relationship. The brain is not prepared for friendship, for romantic love, and then perhaps in the future for parenting their own children because there's no, the brain does not give that salience, that marriage of oxytocin and dopamine, that excitement about my own attachment. But what we saw that was really troubling that the degree of activation in the brain was predicted by mother-infant synchrony at nine months, and by levels of oxytocin at six years, which told us that the first nine months of life is the place to intervene before there are disruption to the oxytocin system and to the brain development. So we developed a synchrony-based video feedback dyadic intervention for postpartum depression based on the neurobiology of affiliation, which I just described. Uh, this is uh, eight session one and a half hours, we go to their homes, depressed mothers, as much as we tried, they, they really don't come anywhere. It's a video feedback intervention where we take, videotape them in interacting with the babies, we take it to the lab, we microcode the interaction, and even if in the 10 minutes there were 10 seconds of positive social behavior from mother to baby, baby to mother, we highlight it. Each session has a topic like synchrony, like gaze, like the importance of touch, like mind-mindedness, emotion regulation, and at the end we videotape them and bring it back. We measure symptoms every time, we measure oxytocin with mother and child every time, we videotape for coding behavior every time, and we do a host of measurement, biological measurement before and after, as well as brain-to-brain -brain synchrony, which we take in two suitcases and, again, bring it to their homes because they won't come to the lab. So the brain-to-brain -brain synchrony is also uh, brought to their home, and it is compared to a development, developmental supportive therapy, which has all the features without taking the videos to the lab. It's about the infant, and it doesn't teach the mother specifically about interaction, but it's about the infant. It has a videotape every session, and it allows the mother to speak about developmental milestone. This is our... We recruit through the internet, through, um, and this is uh, our preliminary result. They're not so preliminary. We collected about, we were supposed to collect 200, and this is data from 140 moms, so it's, it's pretty solid. The first thing you see is very encouraging, is that depression declines. By the fifth session, mothers are at cutoff, and they keep on going down to six and seven. There are 10 sessions before, after, and each of the eight sessions they report on their depressive level, and they go down. There are two things note to be noted here. First, that the two interventions do exactly the same in terms of symptom reduction, which means the second intervention without the video feedback is more scalable nationwide, worldwide, so it's encouraging. The second is that just as the symptom goes down, the standard deviation goes way up. So that means that most of the mothers go down even more, but there are approximately 15% of the mothers that we don't help. And I would be hoping that by the time we have all the data, the microbiome and the brain and the hormones and the immune biomarkers and the behavior, we can use a machine a uh, learning algorithm that will tell us which mothers are likely not going to be uh, benefiting from our intervention, because there are some mothers that we're not doing well with, and the others go down a lot more. Second I want to share with you is the finding of the brain-to-brain -brain synchrony, which is really nice, because it shows reparation at the level of the brain, but I cannot show you because there are no reparation at the level of... Technician, please, if you can fix this again. This I need to show you. I can talk it out. <laughs> okay. So what we do in this paradigm is that they do the phone thing. They do the social interaction, and then moms is unavailable on the phone, and again, the social interaction. And so far, I have data from this first social, and the last social, the reparation is always a lot harder. And for, as you saw, for depressed moms, 
coming back from out of synchrony is especially difficult. So what you see in the brain, and I'm sure you remember that link. Remember the link of attachment in theta, the mother's central region, uh, where the mirror neurons are, and the child's right temporal. And this is the link that is impaired in the depressed mother and their infant. The children are not getting sufficient input, online input during conversation to their developing, maturing social brain. The reunion, we see a lot more disruption. There are seven links that are. Remember that if you want, there are 64 potential links. So to find significance, you have to divide the result in 64. There's a lot less connectivity, but in order to find a significant link, there are a lot, a lot of Bonferroni correction. Uh, so seven links is a lot less connectivity overall. But when you look at those seven connections, you see they either come to the infant's right temporal region or left temporal region. So there's very difficult for these mothers to stimulate the child's social brain. But look what happened. It is completely rescued after the intervention. This link between the mother's central, right central region, so the mother's right, infant right, is able to communicate um, fully again after an eight weeks of intervention. And even more so at reunion. Mothers learn about reunions. Mothers practice reunion. At uh, eight weeks later, the brain is rescued on all those seven links. And as to changes in behavior, remember said Madonna? Look at these... Um, uh, reparation in all three aspects of behavior. Uh, mother depressed moods, completely gone down to the level of the green, which is the control, healthy moms that are just seen before and after. Mother's negative affect, completely gone down to the level of control, healthy moms before and after. And parent gaze, completely increased toward the infant, no difference between those with a very complex video feedback and those with a developmental intervention. In terms of infant behavior, usually in the second six months, infant markedly increase their vocalization, their gaze, their attention to object, and decrease their withdrawal. What you see here with a positive is that infant of depressed mothers usually stop and do not develop, and here you see that um, the intervention allowed these behavior to emerge and infant withdrawal is reduced. And the one thing when they um, lost out, the one th what, where, where you see the gain, the specific gains for the uh, video feedback is the intrusiveness. That mothers, uh, we highlight the importance of touching and looking and vocalizing to the infant. So mothers who are not in the video feedback interaction and learn to do it in a synchronous way, increase it all, but in an intrusive way. So intrusiveness is the one element where we see the benefits, the specific benefits to the uh, video feedback intervention, even more so you'll see than, uh, than the mothers in the, in the control, the healthy control. And here I have uh, an example of one mother who allowed me to give an example, mothers before and mothers after, but I can't operate it from here, so the technician has to operate just here. This is mothers that use toys, very typical, putting a loud sound. And when she talks, she talks to the experimenter. Adult speech, <laughs> Okay, let's move to the after. This is not even after, it's from session six. And let's look at it now. Touch synchrony, the word, gay synchrony, oxytocin, which closeness. Good. So to summarize, we can close it and move on. The three foundations of the biology of love, 
the oxytocin system that implicates plasticity at the cellular, molecular, and network assembly level. It links with the stress reward and immune system. It sustains empathy and a sense of transcendence, the meaning dimension. The affiliative brain that builds on the mammalian maternal care integrates cortical network, sustain also romantic love and friendship, and expands the meaning dimension to love to abstract ideas, such as homeland, God, the biosphere, um, uh, abstract commitments. And biobehavioral synchrony coordinates biology and behavior, develops within the mother-infant bond, contains brief periods of match and longer periods of non-match, and switches or shifts from non-verbal to a mature dialogue. But not only that, these three foundations of the biology of love enables humans to transfer from the intimacy of the parent-infant bond to life within social groups. So the oxytocin system also supports social cognition, our ability to read other minds. It binds individual into social group. It sustains in-group cohesion and also out-group derogation. Oxytocin supports both love and hatred. It's not the hormone that sustains love. It binds us to our own, demar demarcate those we are fear of. Brain-to-brain uh, -brain synchrony allows us to coordinate our brains both with one-on-one -on -one and with larger groups. And biobehavioral synchrony gives rise and sustain all the ability of cultural activity that we found throughout human history, where humans uh, dance together, sing together in houses of prayer, have cultural rituals, and through that uh, and the shared meaning, create a sense of collaboration and transcendence. And I'd like to just end with a beautiful quote from John Steinbeck from The Grape of Wrath that talks about that. The people in poverty drove through many obstacles, needed a lot of resilience to reach the promised land. In the evening, a strange thing happened. The 20 families became one family. The children were the children of all. The loss of home became one loss and the golden time in the West was one dream. And it might be that a sick child threw despair into the hearts of a hundred people, that a birth there in the tent kept a hundred people quiet and awestruck through the night and filled a hundred people with a birth joy in the morning. Every night, a world created. Every night, relationships that make a world established. Established, I would say, through the power of synchrony. So thanks to my students who conducted these studies, thanks to our funders, and thank you for listening.